Hello. Today I'm happy to announce that this Thursday Bayer will complete the acquisition of Monsanto. This is good news for several reasons. It's first of all good news for our customers, the farmers around the world. No matter what type of If you had told someone two decades ago that by 2018 the company that commercialized chemical warfare and the company that commercialized Agent Orange were going to team up to control a quarter of the world's food supply, chances are you would have been labeled a loony. Unless your name was Robert P. Shapiro. He was CEO of Monsanto from 1995 to 2000, and in 1999 he told Businessweek that the company's goal was to wed three of the largest industries in the world agriculture, food, and health that now operate as separate businesses. But there are a set of changes that will lead to their integration. With this month's announcement that Bayer had completed its $63 billion acquisition of Monsanto, it is hard to deny that Shapiro's vision has been realized. Too bad for all of us, that vision is a nightmare. Because, contrary to the feel-good corporate propaganda being churned out by the company's PR department, Propaganda that would have you believe that this merger will be good for the environment, for farmers, for ending global hunger, and, incidentally, for lining the pockets of shareholders. These two corporate giants are in fact committed to the consolidation and transformation of the world's food supply in the hands of the genetic engineers. Monsanto and Bayer are a match made in hell. This is The Corbett Report. It is hardly surprising that the first thing Bayer did after completing their takeover of Monsanto earlier this month was to announce that they were dropping the Monsanto name, merging the two companies' agrochemical divisions under the Bayer Crop Science name. After all, as everyone knows, Monsanto is one of the most hated corporations in the world. In the f film uh, Food Evolution, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson notes that Monsanto is one of the most hated companies in the world. Why do people have such strong feelings uh, toward Monsanto? The worldwide march against Monsanto has drawn hundreds out onto the streets here in New York City with people seizing the opportunity to voice their uh, concerns and opposition uh, to GMO foods. Why are you here? <laughs> I am here because I have a loathing hatred for the company Monsanto, which uh, a lot of people don't know that Monsanto is actually just a chemical company and they have no business uh, basically dictating our food supply. New at noon, the city of Seattle is suing biotech giant Monsanto to make it pay for removing cancer-causing chemicals in the water. The city says the company knowingly dumped the compounds in the city's drainage system and the Duwamish River for years. Seattle needs to build a stormwater treatment plant to clean the system. That will cost about $27 million. Six other major municipalities sued Monsanto as well. Environmental lawyers have begun filing lawsuits against Monsanto for cancer deaths related to their product Roundup. What these lawsuits are showing is an effort both on the part of Monsanto and the U.S. government to minimize the message about the dangers of Roundup in relationship to human cancer. Now your bullseye is on Monsanto. Why is Monsanto so crucial to this fight over seeds? Monsanto is crucial to this fight because they are the biggest seed company now. Monsanto is privatizing the seed. They control 95% of the cotton in India, 90% of the soil in this country. They've taken over most of the seed companies of the world. This hatred of Monsanto is not unreasonable. It is, after all, difficult to think of a company that has ruined the lives of more people around the world either directly through its coercive and litigious practices against small farmers the world over, or indirectly through the pollution of the food supply with their genetically modified crops. Many are familiar with the company's sordid past, including its role in the development of Agent Orange and its contribution to the epidemic of farmer suicides in India. But in recent years, Monsanto has gained special notoriety for its attempt to push the boundary of patent law in a self-admitted effort to gain a monopoly over the world's food supply. Even worse, Monsanto has, thanks to a revolving door with the highest levels of the U.S. government, been not just evil, 
but extraordinarily effective in spreading its evil seed around the world. That revolving door has seen literally dozens of top Monsanto executives drift in and out of the U.S. government agencies that, laughably, are said to regulate the agrochemical business, including Dennis DeConcini, the former U.S. senator who now acts as legislative consultant for Monsanto, Mickey Cantor, the Commerce Secretary under President Clinton who also served on Monsanto's board of directors, Michael Taylor, Obama's Deputy FDA Commissioner who had previously served as Monsanto's Vice President for Public Policy, Linda Fisher, who was appointed Deputy Administrator of the EPA in 2001, fresh off a five-year stint as Monsanto's Vice President of Government and Public Affairs, and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who served as a corporate lawyer for Monsanto in the 1970s. These officials have helped smooth the way for Monsanto to achieve a number of key corporate objectives, including the passage of the infamous Monsanto Protection Act in 2013. First off, President Barack Obama recently signed into law what many are calling the Monsanto Protection Act. Monsanto, the world's leading producer of genetically modified food, will benefit greatly from the bill since the legislation gives companies dealing in modified organisms and genetically engineered seeds immunity from federal courts. Nothing creepy about that. The bill states that even if future research shows that GMOs or GE seeds cause major health issues in consumers, the federal courts will have no power to stop their spread, use, or sale. Interesting to note, the bill carrying the Monsanto Rider has virtually nothing to do with food, agriculture, or consumer health. It was inserted into a spending bill through lobbying efforts and the good work of freshman Senator Roy Blunt. Well, congratulations, Mr. Blunt. Well done. Very good. Maybe write him a letter. I love Mr. Blunt because Monsanto's such a wonderfully, like, healthy, nutritious company. Really looking out, you know, and I'm <laughs> it's amazing. The Center for Responsive Politics notes that Senator Blunt received $64,250 oh. from Monsanto oh. for his campaign committee between but 2000 and That had nothing to do with him making a protection of bill or anything not. like that. That was just purely good citizenry at work. Of course. Uh, Mr. Mr. Blunt has been the largest Republican recipient of Monsanto funding as of late. Oh, lovely. So basically, my, you know, Mr. Blunt gave him an out clause. <laughs> we don't know what these GMO seeds and all that crazy they do does sorry for the sailor talk but you know we don't know what these cats do they basically are, are poisoning you know the plants to kill bugs and their the, pesticides are actually killing the bee population there's research to prove it and now because of this law technically we can't do anything about yeah, it yeah we can't go back as citizens the government can't go back and sue mm -hmm. them or, or hold them accountable for any of the actions yeah. that they've done this is beautiful this is wonderful politics as usual you know the old uh, you know pay to play kind of technique of you know we'll give you x amount of dollars get you elected and then help us out here but ironically of all the corporations in the world Bayer is one of the few that could compete with Monsanto for its position as the world's most evil company there are two huge issues with this Bear Monsanto merger. Uh, the first is that it's going to raise food prices all across the United States even, and even beyond our borders. Farmers have already experienced a 300 percent price increase in recent years on everything from seeds to fertilizer, all of which are controlled by Monsanto. And every forecaster is predicting that these prices are going to climb even higher because of this merger. So we're going to have this massive price hike at a time when 14 million Americans have already been unable to provide food for their families. And and then we're going to have this ethical problem that's plagued both of these corporations for decades. Let's start with Monsanto. This is a company that produced Agent Orange, which resulted in one of the largest human-induced health epidemics in modern history. They made dioxin. They created and distributed PCBs across the planet. And now pending litigation against them for Roundup is right there. Looking at their rap sheet would scare the heck out of anybody with a brain. They're in the business. Actually, really, when you drill down to it, it looks more like a cancer business than anything. They've been hit for false advertising and bribing public officials, then moved to Bear. So we got Bear and we got Monsanto. Moved to Bear. This is a company that's joined at the hip with the Nazis during World War II. They produced a clotting agent for hemophiliacs in 1980s called Factor 8. This blood clotting agent was tainted with HIV. And then after the government told them they couldn't sell it here, they shipped it all over the all over the world, infecting people all over the world. That's the company. That's part, that's just part 
part of the bear story. Right now, they're facing lawsuits over products like Yaz, uh, Zarelto, uh, Esure, Cipro. In fact, the company in 2014 annual report listed 32 different liability lawsuits that the company's now facing. So now you have the worst of the worst joining with the worst of the worst, and we have this magnificent experience of greed with these two huge corporations. This is a merger of evil, probably second only to the kind of merger that we'd see with DuPont and Dow Chemical. It's an ugly story. Again, the media is missing the point. They're not looking at all behind what these people are all, and they're people. These, are, these corporations are regarded as people. If these are people on a witness stand, they're, <laughs> it's going to be a very ugly cross-examination. These are people who should probably be in prison rather than engaging in mergers. Although less well known by the general public, Bayer's shameful history is, like Monsanto's, a case study in corporate psychopathy. Founded in 1863 by Friedrich Bayer and Johann Friedrich Vescott, it wasn't until 1899 that the company trademarked its most well-known product, aspirin. Less well-remembered is the fact that Bayer was the first company to trademark heroin, which they marketed as a non-addictive alternative to morphine and a cough suppressant. But it was under the stewardship of Carl Duesberg at the turn of the 20th century that the company began to develop its psychopathic character. In 1914, the German Ministry of War appointed Duesberg as one of the co-directors of a commission into the use of dangerous byproducts from the chemical industry. Unsurprisingly, Duesberg and his fellow directors jumped at the opportunity to turn their waste into profit by recommending the development of chlorine gas for use on the battlefield a direct contravention of the Hague Convention respecting the laws and customs of war on land, which Germany had signed just seven years earlier. Bayer, under Duisburg's command, did not just participate in the development and use of poison gas in warfare. They spearheaded it. Duisburg personally oversaw the earliest tests of poison gas and bragged about its lethal capabilities. The enemy won't even know when an area has been sprayed with it, and will remain quietly in place until the consequences occur. Setting up a school for chemical warfare at Bayer headquarters in Leverkusen, Duisburg also oversaw the development of phosgene and mustard gas, which he urged the German government to use. This phosgene is the meanest weapon I know. I strongly recommend that we not let the opportunity of this war pass without also testing gas grenades. On April 22, 1915, Duisburg got his wish, on that day, 170 tons of chlorine gas was used against French troops at Ypres, Belgium, killing 1,000 and injuring a further 4,000. Attacks on the British followed days later. In all, some 60,000 people died as the result of the chemical warfare perfected by Bayer and urged on by Duisburg, one of the great, largely forgotten atrocities of the First World War. Most galling of all, Duisburg was not ashamed of his accomplishments. On the contrary, he was immensely proud of them. He even commissioned famed artist Otto Ballhagen to paint the scene of the earliest poison gas test at Cologne. Duisburg so enjoyed the finished result that he had it hung in his breakfast room at Bayer headquarters in Leverkusen. Later, Duisburg, inspired by a tour of Rockefeller's Standard Oil in the U.S., wedded Bayer to the IG Farben chemical cartel. As I explained in How Big Oil Conquered the World, IG Farben was a key player in the burgeoning oligarchy of the early 20th century, boasting key oligarchs like Royal Dutch Shell's Prince Bernhard and Standard Oil's Walter Teagle on the boards of its various branches. Byers Duisburg served as the head of its supervisory board. Joining Duisburg on the board was Fritz Termier, who oversaw the construction of the IG Farben factory at Auschwitz, which ran on slave labor and participated in human experimentation. After the war, Termier was sentenced to seven years in prison for his participation in looting and enslavement of the camp prisoners, but was released in 1954, good behavior, and in 1956 became chairman of Bayer AG, newly resurrected from the ashes of IG Farben. But this legacy of death is not some ancient relic of Bayer's distant past. Decade after decade, the company continues to be involved in scandal after scandal, involving wanton environmental destruction, injury, and even mass murder. Bayer accidentally funds studies showing its pesticide is killing the bees and promptly denies those conclusions. A large-scale study on neonicotinoid pesticides is adding to the growing body of evidence 
that these agriculture chemicals are indeed harming bee populations, to say the very least. Carried out at 33 sites in the United Kingdom, Germany, Hungary, the study found that exposure to neonicotinoids, quote, left honeybee hives less likely to survive over winter, while bumblebees and solitary bees produced fewer queens, end quote. Mirena is a chemical-coated, soft plastic IUD that proved to be a huge moneymaker for Bayer. But part of the reason that this particular contraceptive was so profitable was because Bayer was deliberately overstating the benefits of their device and not disclosing some of the rare but dangerous side effects. For example, in April of 2009, the FDA had to issue a warning letter to Bayer Healthcare because its website for Mirena made a number of claims that were simply untrue or unproven. Bear was so busy making claims that the IUD was a perfect solution for busy moms and would increase women's sex lives while making them look and feel great that it forgot to mention that the device is recommended for women who've already had at least one child. The company also declined to state that the Mirena IUD increases the risk of ectopic pregnancies, which is when a fertilized egg attaches to an area other than the uterus. So the CEO was actually speaking to Bloomberg Business Week, and he is trying to appeal the Indian court's decision to uh, allow this patent for another company. He said the following, we did not develop this medicine for Indians. We developed it for Western patients who can afford it. Oh, oh, oh. and look at that face. That's the kind of face that would say a thing like that. Doesn't he look so smug, like, oh, please, we didn't develop this for Indians. It's we developed disgusting. it for Westerners who are rich. In the 1980s, Bayer Corporation produced a medicine that was supposed to improve the lives of hemophiliacs. Bayer didn't tell those hemophiliacs that their product was infected with HIV. Because of that, entire families of hemophiliacs died with AIDS as the virus spread within households. When Bayer was ordered to stop selling their drug in America, they dumped their AIDS-laden product in Asia and killed Asian families. No one with Bayer management was arrested. No one who made these psychopathic quality decisions went to prison. They claimed the protection of their status as a corporation. That corporate status gave management the ability to kill people for profit and not go to prison. Indeed, it is not difficult to see why these two companies each one a titan of its respective industry, each one guilty of the most atrocious crimes against humanity and the destruction of the environment, would feel an affinity for each other. But why merge? What does a pharmaceutical giant have to gain from buying out and merging with an agrochemical giant, especially one that carries as much baggage as Monsanto? If the connection between these corporate behemoths seems tenuous, then perhaps the key to understanding it is presented in that 1995 quote from former Monsanto CEO Robert Shapiro. We're talking about three of the largest industries in the world, agriculture, food, and health, that now operate as separate businesses. But there are a set of changes that will lead to their integration. Integration of agriculture, food, and health is the goal. And once that goal is reached, the entire life support system of the human population, including all our food and medicine, will be in the hands of a few megacorporations. Indeed, the history of the production of food and pharmaceuticals has always followed the same trajectory, away from natural, abundant, locally produced organic materials and toward artificial, scarce, factory-produced synthetic alternatives. Control of the global food supply is, needless to say, along with control of money and oil, one of the pillars upon which the globalist oligarchs seek to construct their system of total control. Although there is no proof whatsoever that he said it, the dubious quote sometimes attributed to Henry Kissinger is nonetheless quite true. Who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the energy can control whole continents. Who controls money can control the world. The process of consolidating these industries is of course nothing new. In fact, it started long ago. As I explained in How Big Oil Conquered the World, even the current agrochemical industry has to be seen in its historical context as a fusion of the petrochemical fertilizer giants DuPont, Dow, Hercules Powder, and other businesses in the standard oil orbit with the ABC seed cartel of Archer Daniels Midland, Bunge, Cargill, and Louis Dreyfus. These previously separate fields were gradually consolidated under the flag of agribusiness, itself developed at Harvard Business School in the 1950s with the help of research conducted by Vasily Leontief for the Rockefeller Foundation. 
And as I also explained in How Big Oil Conquered the World, Big Pharma too was a creation of the same drive toward consolidation and spearheaded by the same people. From the Carnegie and Rockefeller-funded institutionalization of the medical profession, to Standard Oil's role in supplying the petrochemicals for the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry, to the role of Rockefeller Institute researchers like Cornelius Rhodes who developed chemotherapy from the mustard gas pioneered by Bayer, the overlap of the oligarchical interests in cementing global control has been abundantly clear. Then, with the advancement of GMO technology in the 1980s and 1990s, again with considerable help from the Rockefellers and other oligarchical interests, new opportunities for consolidation presented themselves. Seeds used to be sold by seed companies, and fertilizers and herbicides used to be sold by chemical companies. But then the GMO revolution came along, and all of these companies spun off biotech branches to genetically engineer seeds. That, in turn, opened up opportunities to create GMO seed strains that are tailored to work with patented herbicides and fertilizers. The combination of GMO seeds and specially tailored agrochemicals has been especially lucrative for Monsanto, which was the first to capitalize on those synergies when it won regulatory approval for its first Roundup-ready soybeans in 1994. Roundup, aka glyphosate, has gone on to become the most used agricultural chemical in the history of the world. Monsanto and Bayer, not to mention their cohorts in the agrochemical, pharmaceutical, and euphemistically named life sciences industries, are ultimately seeking the same thing. Complete control over the population, from the genetic engineering of its food supply to the control of its medicines and chemicals. It is a race toward complete centralization, and with this acquisition, Bayer and Monsanto are getting a head start. Particularly frightening, then, though hardly surprising, that this latest round of consolidation is being spearheaded by two corporations as thoroughly deplorable as Bayer and Monsanto. Bayer, one of the pieces of IG Farben's grim and oligarchical legacy, supplier of chemicals for the poison gas attacks of World War I, knowing seller of HIV-contaminated vaccines, mass murderer of bees, seller of tainted GMO crops, and Monsanto, dumper of toxic chemicals, proud seller of carcinogens, sewer of farmers, cause of farmer suicides, suppressor of scientific dissent. Are you feeling safe knowing that a quarter of the world's food supply will soon be in their combined hands? If not, then all of the efforts that have been made in recent years to march against Monsanto must be translated into a boycott against Bayer and all of their friends in the burgeoning biotech Big Agra seed cartel GMO Franken industry. It is only by increasing our support for locally sourced, organic, heirloom seed grown produce that we can hope to supplant this new mega giant and consign it to the dustbin of history where it belongs. The Corbett Report. Welcome back to the New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Poato of MediaMonarchy.com. Britain appoints Minister of Loneliness. We've got that story plus your autonomous chariot awaits. But first, just four days after the residents of Hawaii lived through 38 minutes of doomsday hell, after that false public broadcast alarm announced that a ballistic missile launch was headed for the island, only to reverse and announce later that it was a mistake. Four days later... Japan's national broadcaster, NHK's app, issued a false J alert to phones over a North Korean missile launch at 6.55 p.m. Tuesday evening local time. The message received by phone users with the NHK app installed on their iDevices or smartphones of choice read, quote, NHK news alert, North Korea likely to have launched a missile. The government J alert, evacuate inside the building or underground. James, the odds of this really kind of stretch, I mean, you've already done a video about this, discussing how the first event in Hawaii stretched the limits of credibility. This second one, four days later, coming, what is new missile systems going into place? It seems like they're, I don't know, I don't know, it seems like they're running drills in some ways and they're goofing it up. It seems like they're prepping a lot. 
It does. In fact, I have a different possibility that, in fact, I think is probably further confirmed by some recent events that seem unrelated at first glance. But before that, I got a lot of emails and messages from people expressing concern for myself and my family over here in Japan and what was it like. Well, don't worry, we do not have the NHK app installed on our Fondle Slab to get those fake news alerts. So I didn't even hear about this. I didn't know about it until well after the fact on Twitter. In fact, on English Twitter, not even on Japanese Twitter, as people were saying, what, what's going on? So n absolutely no, uh, no panic or alarm over here, at least not in our household and not at all that I saw in any sort of day-to-day -day life here. I don't think anyone took that alert seriously, or at least not nearly as seriously as the Hawaiian one, which of course was is issued by the actual emergency alert system, not some, you know, fake news uh, alert broadcast. So um, having said that, as I say, I think I, obviously, I mean, as, as incredulous as I was over the first fake alarm, um, the second one clearly indicates something. I mean, once may be accident, two is a pattern. Um, three times is an attack, as they say, right? So, um, so obviously something's going on here. And as I say, I think this relates to a story that, interestingly enough, is just coming back to the, uh, the forefront now after some time out of the news. But you'll remember... Last year, with those incidents with the U.S. Uh, Navy destroyers, the USS Fitzgerald and the USS John S. McCain, is that right? Where these U.S. Navy destroyers, both of them, just happened to have collisions uh, in the middle of nowhere in the in the Pacific. Out of you know what what on earth was that about? And immediately there were stories about cyber attack, hack. You know what what happened? GPS spoofing, and then immediately it was like, no, 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 it was just. Just uh, negligence on both counts. The commanders of U.S. Navy destroyers just happened to guide their destroyers into, you know, passing ships. I mean, wow, who would have... Uh, what a strange thing. And now, in fact, the uh, U.S. Navy just released their collision reports, so we'll link to that. And uh, also the update story as the, the officers in charge of the ships are now facing um, negligent homicide charges over those incidents. So it's coming back to the, the forefront of the news. And I, I don't know. I think, again, that's another extremely, even one of those cases, extremely unlikely that it's just, oh, uh, negligence. So, you know, oops, we, we steered this destroyer into a ship. But two of them taking place immediately does make one think, what is going on here? Is there hacking? Is there GPS spoofing? Is there some sort of cyber attack going on that they're, they're obviously not going to let the public know about? In the same way these fake missile alerts, is there cyber attacks going on? Are, have these been hacked, these systems? Would they alert the public that, oh yeah, our alert system was hacked and you know they, they issued an, an alarm? Of course they wouldn't. If they did even, then the real question would be, okay, well, who's hacking? Is it the Chinese? Is it the North Koreans? Is it the Russians? Or is it the deep state? started to trying to start something, trying to kick something off. Again, these are all possibilities that are swirling around right now. And I think this second fake a new alarm only further raises that possibility. Um, again, we'll have to see how this plays out, but it's something that occurs to me. The only radio I listen to here in Portland, there's actually a non-commercial jazz radio station. Unfortunately, a couple of times a day, they do carry the National Petroleum Radio. And I heard yesterday... They were hyping and pushing the new the new collision reports in the in the damage just yesterday. Just all hype there, right? Right. I think they maybe even led their news broadcast with it. A couple other notes related to all of this. You can actually turn off all those alerts in the settings if you have an eye device, all the amber alerts and all that kind of stuff. They just make you kind of drill down deep, deep, deep into the settings. Um I think some really interesting kind of synchromistic bits kind of swirling around the events in Hawaii and in Japan this week, even actually kind of right now at this very moment, is basically the 125th anniversary of the U.S. coup that originally overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy back in 1893. Now, James, you went over in your video about the, the test, the drill in Hawaii. And of course, it had the, 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 all, the all seeing eye, the very total information awareness pyramid. I, of course, caught it in the footage and went to go post about it and saw it. Of course, not the only one catching that. I found it also pretty interesting that they roll out Mr. Miyagi as kind of the fall guy. Media adult folks like myself might know that's the guy in the Karate Kid movies. Um, James, we'll continue to alarm on, alarm off. There you go. There you go. No, in many ways, and we'll do it a couple more times in this episode, we kind of laugh to not cry at the news. 
Our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 334, General Motors, Government Motors, as it's occasionally sometimes known, unveiled the Cruise AV, an autonomous vehicle with no steering wheels or pedals, announcing it had asked the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to exempt it from another a, a number rather of federal standards that cannot be met with a driverless car. So they rolled this thing out over the weekend to much fanfare. GM executives have said they plan to introduce a large-scale fleet of self-driving taxis by 2019, a time frame some analysts consider ambitious. GM released images of the Cruise AV and video of the interior with a strikingly spacious windshield devoid of that pesky steering wheel. General Motors president Dan Aman told the AFP, quote, it's quite a striking image when people see it for the first time. I think people will want to engage with the technology and understand it and experience it. But I think what's really most powerful about what the technology can offer is an increase in safety on the road. And once people understand that and see it and experience, we think the adoption will be there. Some people are more than ready and other people will be watching and seeing how it evolves. We've been watching and seeing how all this evolves. James, driverless cars, are you ready to hop on board? <sighs> Certainly not. And I don't think I have anything more to say about the subject other than what I've already said. So I'll direct people back to my, uh, my video from last summer about welcome to the driverless future. But yes, the long story short, of course, I think we all know where this is heading. And this is heading to a wonderful world where you never have to think about driving again and all of this great wonderful convenience and blah 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 and oh by the way you know once in a while you know 0.0001% of the time yeah maybe a whistleblower will get into a mysterious crash somehow the AI just malfunctioned oh wow shucks you know too bad for you um so Again, I think we understand the power and the control that comes with this technology, taking the power and the control out of your hands, literally, and putting it in the hands of algorithms that are being programmed by someone somewhere and that can be hacked and all of that stuff. So, again, I've said all this before. Um, I note that even on Twitter when I was uh, posting about this, I saw replies about, oh, it'll be so great for, you know, the cripples who can now drive and whatever. First of all, has that ever been something? Like if you're paralyzed, you want to drive a car? <laughs> like has, that's never been a possibility. So why is this suddenly something that we need to revolutionize the entire auto industry to accommodate? But even then, yeah, sure, great. Okay, well, so we'll have a couple thousand cars for people who are literally paralyzed and who can't have anyone drive them around, well, that'll be great for that. But again, do we need to revolutionize the entire auto industry and everything, the way our society is structured around that? It's like the, the brain chip thing. Yeah, it'll help cripples to type, great. But do we also want all of the other things that come along with implanting brain chips in people and uh, you know mind-reading technologies and all this nonsense that's coming along? So again, it's the obviously slippery slope. We are obviously being conditioned and programmed. And again, this is another point where you have the choice to buy this technology or to not buy this technology. And I know which way I'm going to go. James, you kind of sound like you, for one, do not welcome our new technocratic overlords. So on my recent morning show, it was actually yesterday's morning show, I talked about the Hawaii situation and the Japan nuclear kind of psyops. Also, kind of all swirling around this, I talked about this autonomous vehicle. I also covered the CIA's good friends at Bell Helicopter. They're teaming up with Uber to roll out some helicopter taxis. And speaking of these autonomous vehicles, James, can you guess what Ford's new AI vehicle is called? I genuinely don't know. So I will say, uh, my first guess would be Hal, but maybe that's too in your face. So it's probably something more chummy. It's probably Henry, you know, for Ford. How about Argo? Mm, okay. They're Ford's new AI vehicle. They call it Argo. So the intelligence connections never seem too far behind. And on that same jam-packed morning show with the nuclear psyops and the intelligence cars, I also covered the Chelsea Manning Senate run, Moby's CIA friends, and Seinfeld's Zionist pals. So, whew, after we've... Cruised all over town in our autonomous Argo mobiles, our fondle slabs loosely held in our weakened grips because all, you know, all the ports have been removed on our eye vending machines and 
come back to your subdivision sector, you know, just a little bit ahead of curfew. But then what? Sure, you get some smart grid credits for turning off the lights a little bit early, but you're lonely. Have no fear. They are from the government and they are here to help. Britain is combating one of society's biggest modern health problems, social isolation, by appointing a minister for loneliness. Her name is Tracy Crouch, and her position was just officially announced by the British government. Crouch, whose official title is Minister for Sport and Civil Society, is tasked with coming up with a strategy to combat feelings of isolation for people of all ages and to figure out a way to measure the varying degrees of alienation in a statistical format. This according to a statement released by the Office of Prime Minister Theresa May. The new role was created after recent research in the UK found that one in 10 people always are often felt lonely and that 200,000 elderly people haven't had a conversation with a friend or a relative in over a month. We will include the links to the UK's press release. And James, even as I was just kind of just there going through the text again, it makes it sound like they're coming up with a strategy to combat feelings of isolation and that they're looking for a way to measure all of this. It's almost like data's the new oil or something. So it's another great like touchy-feely idea that you'd just have to be a heartless monster to criticize, right? Well, Unless this all kind of fits in with the coming kind of medical panopticon, the technocratic panopticon. Hey, maybe your smart fridge can tell the Amazon key delivery guy that your mandatory like monthly meeting with your loneliness detection officers coming up, James. Oh, boy. Well, you know, I want I, I know people who who are feeling this or isolated, feel lonely, despite all the connection that comes with being online and, you know, instantly accessible to the world and all of that. But people do feel loneliness, do feel depression, do feel isolated, increasingly so in these crowded urban environments, as counterintuitive as that might sound. And I, it's a genuine worry, something that I've really thought about. And how do we reconnect and reform society in a way that's meaningful and, and provides social cohesion? And But now that the UK has a, appointed a, prime, a minister to, to look after this, I guess it's all, we don't have to worry about it anymore. The government's in charge. They'll take care of it. Because apparently appointing a minister for loneliness will cure loneliness. You know, just as uh, pointing, you know, right, declaring a war on poverty ends poverty, right? Uh, yes. Um, no, I mean, don't, don't go out there and get a pet. Don't go out there and, and start a hobby to meet like-minded people. Don't go out there in physical locations in real life to actually meet other human beings, talk to them and exchange ideas, have, have actual fun in the real world. No, sit in your little isolated apartment or whatever in the middle of the city and wait for the minister of loneliness to tell you how to feel more connected or feel less isolated by joining some government program or something, hopefully. Or uh, or maybe they'll just have the, the electrodes they can wire into your brain and get rid of those pesky feelings, right? It'll it'll come one day, the brain chip. Uh, yeah. Now, again, the solutions to this are relatively simple. I know this is a real problem that people have in social anxiety and all of this, but again, there are real... This is not a, a new phenomenon. This has been happening for thousands of years. I'm sure there are ways around this that don't involve going to government to try to get them to dispense some, some sort of answer from the clouds. Yeah, which, again, it doesn't even seem like they want an answer. They just want to, like, run all the statics, you know, the statisticians and then crunch all the numbers on it. James, you and I have actually talked about this. I've asked you about it even kind of off mic as I've had my own kind of feelings of, of isolation here. I work from home and it wasn't always that way in media monarchy. It's just been that way for the last probably three years. And there's some days where I go, oh, my God, I, I've only talked to my cat. And that's why I you know, run my mouth a bunch when my wife finally gets home. So maybe in some ways, maybe some sort of good little anecdote, antidote to this that I think you're just kind of talking about. I saw it said in my chat early this week, I just had a couple of good longtime Media Monarchy supporters meet up IRL in real life over the weekend. So that is really good news to me. So I've been trying to build community, not conspiracy, for 12 plus years at MediaMonarchy.com. I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday. And it's all at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. James, thanks, buddy. All right. Well, hats off to you for that. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next IRL meetup. And let's hope uh, you can make it over to Japan. Someday soon, you and I really should launch. We'll just do the Kickstarter, Indiegogo, chip in, whatever. 
make the Jameses meet. Now, I know you might not be super excited about coming on over here to the USSA, so I guess you might just have to be Pilato heading on over to Japan. So I'm, we'll have to- I'm fully on board with that. We'll see, we'll see how it works. At any rate, uh, again, we will be providing the answers and solutions going forward from here to the uh, problems that government only wants to analyze. So there you go. Uh, another three great stories. Thank you for that, James, and looking forward to it next week. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Palato of MediaMonarchy.com. Beat the Southern Poverty Law Center. We got that story plus the Ministry of Truth being set up in California. But first, police chief calls press conference and arrests everybody who shows up. Over the weekend, the police chief for the Leon Valley Police Department in Texas called a late afternoon press conference to talk about all these police accountability activists that have been live streaming their friendly neighborhood officers. However, as soon as the conference began, Chief Joseph Salvaggio began arresting people and then detained the entire crowd. Now, the backstory to this, the setup, over the past two months, Salvaggio has been the subject of multiple videos and independent media articles for his alleged corruption. According to the group National Association for Individual Rights, controversy began the day after May Day, May 2nd, when Jesus Padilla was arrested while filming outside Leon Valley City Hall. It continued into last week, and as the Free Thought Project reported, where we get this article from, multiple people were arrested for their freedom of speech last week as they desecrated a thin blue line American flag, which seemed to be becoming quite popular. As the conference began, Salvaggio announced the immediate arrest of one of the activists. First and foremost, said Salvaggio as he walked out of City Hall and approached the crowd that gathered Bao. Come over here. You're under arrest. After arresting Bao Nguyen, Salvaggio began to address the rest of the media, many of whom were legit credentialed reporters. I totally, totally support your right to put something online, your First Amendment right, said Salvaggio before completely negating that statement. Everybody else, you are not free to leave. You are witnesses. Every one of y'all, witnesses to a crime. Every one of your cameras, your devices, every one of them, they're going to be taken. Every one of y'all, sit down right here. Salvaggio then ordered his officers to arrest every single other person in attendance, including those who tried to walk away. During the press conference, Salvaggio said the arrest were due to comments left on these live streamers' YouTube channels that threaten police officers, as to imply it's their fault people make threats on their channels. Interestingly enough, James, just an hour or so ago, Rika, the hopeful voluntarist, posted the link in the Media Monarchy chat to Bao Nguyen's live stream. His channel, I guess, is called Clash with Bao, and I believe she knows him. They're all over there in Texas, and there was some pretty hefty live stream action going on as I just watched it a little bit ago, so we'll include that in the show notes and the links. But I think if we kind of tie this into the rage purge culture that we've been talking about, James, I keep thinking about that story from a couple of weeks ago about all the Congress critters needing this protection. And we now see kind of breaking out on the streets of America what they're calling the loss of civility, all these public confrontations and shamings. It's getting kind of heated as summer starts to heat up. James, what do you see? Well, I see essentially the, uh, the, I think the power mad narcissistic uh, psychopaths at the very top like to have power mad narcissistic psychopaths underneath them to be the enforcer class but they don't like it when the, those people get out of line in a way that brings draws attention to the process so i do not believe that these arrests are going to stand uh, i mean obviously there is no law about <laughs> someone said something on a youtube chat stream therefore i'm arresting you it, it makes absolutely no sense this will not stand in court of course there's always ways they can apply some silly law in some way that doesn't that's completely out of context to you know put you in jail if they really want to unless uh there's enough ire and public reaction that uh, that becomes unviable and i think that would be the case uh here so i'm not expecting that this will proceed um uh very far in terms of actually arrest of uh, keeping these people in jail but having said that i mean this brings up a number of issues including of course the contentious relationship between the police and the press. And what does the press even mean? The credentialed reporters. That means technically, legally, nothing. Uh, there's no difference between you and a 
credentialed reporter in the eyes of the law uh, for the purposes of the First Amendment, nor should there be. We do not want the government deciding who is and, is and is not a legitimate reporter because we know what direction that will go in. More and more on that in a minute. But, uh, yes, uh, for people who are interested in this whole topic of, well, when is it okay to film the police or to film these types of things and what can we do? I would suggest going way back in the Corbett Report archives to an interview that I did six years ago now with Carlos Miller of Photography is Not a Crime, talking about his travels and travails in, I believe, in Florida, where he uh, had many run-ins with the police trying to tell him that he could not film this or that when he clearly could, and he challenged and won in court numerous times uh, for the crime of trying to photograph the police. Um, it is not a crime in most jurisdictions, in most senses. So, uh, but like anything else, if they, uh, if you don't fight back against this kind of nonsense, they'll just continue pushing. Um, they'll take as much as they can out of uh, public liberties because, hey, no one's pushing back against it. So it is, uh, it is important that we keep the pressure up on this. And as I say, I don't think these uh, current arrests are going to stand. I don't think once it sees a day in court, I don't think this is going to go any further. Isn't it interesting when the sort of when the police state when it kind of gets so sloppy? It's like, whoa, 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 you're kind of you're kind of showing our hand there. You're making it all a little too obvious. So, James, we are pretty much rolling right into a full moon. It's a big kind of extended holiday weekend here in the States, as it's going to be Independence Day next week, and it falls kind of right in the middle. So I know a lot of folks are kind of taking time either on one end or the other. So there's going to be a lot of people kind of out and about and sort of heated it seems like i had somebody asking me just a little bit ago like do, do people seem crazier than, than usual now people seem a little unglued james this is neural next week episode 345 and again to sort of go against everything you were saying that this will never stand this will never happen they can't pass these laws but but wait there's always california california considering creating advisory group for of course fake news with a new Orwellian bill in an Orwellian move straight out of 1984. And a side note, George Orwell would have been 115 this week, by the way. California's proposed a bill to consider creating a fake news advisory group in order to monitor information posted and spread on social media. Senate Bill 1424 would require the California Attorney General to create an advisory committee by April Fool's Day 2019. Further, the council would need to consist of at least one person from the Department of Justice, representatives from social media providers, civil liberties advocates, and First Amendment scholars. The advisory group would be required to study how false information is spread online and come up with a plan for social media platforms to fix the problem. The attorney general would need to present that plan to the legislature by December 31st, 2019. The group would also need to come up with criteria establishing what is fake news and what's just biased information. The EFF, of course, opposes the bill, calling it flawed and misguided. But this is hardly isolated. We see these things in kind of coordinated moves. Of course, the most favored nation, David Rockefeller's favorite joint. In November 2015, the Chinese Communist Party revised its law to impose sentences of up to seven years in prison for spreading rumors about disasters. Meanwhile, of course, in everyone's hated Russia, the Russia Telecom regulator is preparing a draft decree designed purely and simply to block all content that contains false information. We will include, of course, the links to Senate Bill 1424 Internet Social Media Advisory Group. I think they might need maybe like a catchier acronym kind of name. Hopefully, probably this won't pass. It seems kind of a bridge too far. But as we often note on these shows, what about the next time? What about the time after that? The full article from Activist Post goes through the kind of Frankenstein's monster this thing already is. Parts of other terrible bills have bobbed and weaved their way through the California Congress to kind of become this new monstrosity. James? Yes, and we will include a link to the actual Senate bill itself. So please do go and read it and see this, the, this, the text they've struck out. What they took out was the bone-chilling, the even more bone-chilling part of this. The bill would also require the Attorney General to draft potential legislation for mitigating the spread of false information through social media. Legislation 
for mitigating the spread of false information through social media. What does that mean? Well, thankfully, we'll never find out because that text has been struck from the bill uh, until the next time they try to pass it, as you say, exactly the point. And as you know, and as I know, and as I'm sure most of the audience knows, but let's spell it out here, this is a dagger aimed at the heart of the New World Next Week and the Corbett Report and Media Monarchy and all of the other alternative media that you know and love because this is, I mean, Orwellian is the word and I despair of the fact that the 1984 Orwell Big Brother references have been used to death over the past decade or two, but this this is the heart of the nightmare of the 1984 society is that the government gets to decide what is true, what is officially true history, this is what you can say, this is what you cannot say, and eventually it becomes this is what you cannot even think. And again, this was not some political satire, this is becoming reality. This is actually happening, and it is steps like this, which, as you say, it's the war of attrition. Maybe this bill won't make it, maybe the next bill won't make it, but the 37th bill down the line might make it in some form, and that's that's what we have to worry about. This is the ongoing process, and when if we give an inch in this process, they will take a thousand miles, which is why we cannot allow uh, th- allow the government to start dictating what is and is not truth. And can you imagine the kinds of panels that they would set up to try to legislate or, or to, to come to a decision? What, oh, this constitutes fake news, this isn't fake news. This is, this is absolute nightmare stuff. So, uh, you know, good luck to the people of California. And, uh, but don't worry, it's coming to the rest of uh, the states very soon, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as California goes, so goes the nation. They sort of set the set the vibe. And again, this is all kind of predicated on the freak out of of you know the post Trump world of things that have already been kind of going on. And again, as they always say, the real action is in the reaction. So maybe this bill won't pass because maybe there isn't the public outcry to make them force and pass this kind of bill, which we know happens when certain kind of events happen, whether real or provocateur. So our final story this week on New World Next Week is a little bit of good news. Finally, sidebar, I hope to have the return episode of Good News Next Week coming very soon. But this right here is more of the maybe not unmitigated variety. Southern Poverty Law Center pays $3.4 million to resolve defamation case. We get this from the very heady law.com. James, I had to kind of chop this down. So I was like, I, I don't understand some of these legalese terms. But it will be included in the show notes. A well-known civil rights group agreed to apologize also in addition to the $3.4 million for a report that listed a Muslim activist as an anti-Islamic extremist. The Southern Poverty Law Center, the advocacy organization known for exposing hate groups and fighting for civil rights, has agreed to pay 3.3 something, 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 something and issue public apologies to an activist who challenged his inclusion in a 2016 SPLC publication that labeled him and several other people as anti-Muslim extremists. So... Now that this has happened, I think essentially there's there's blood in the water for for better or worse. We take it from PJ Media and James. I kind of talked about this story earlier this week on my morning show, but I hadn't actually covered the sort of inciting incident, as it were. I I covered this sort of the effect. No fewer than 60 organizations that have been branded hate groups or otherwise attacked by the Southern Poverty Law Center are considering legal action against the left wing smear factory. A Christian legal nonprofit leader confirmed to PJ Media, which is where we're getting this story from. He suggested that the three mil settlement and apology the SPLC gave to Majid Nawaz and his Quilliam Foundation would encourage further legal action. We haven't filed anything against the SPLC, but I think a number of organizations have been considering filing lawsuits because they've been doing to a lot of organizations exactly what they did to Majid. James, we, of course, will include the links. I'm surprised it goes all the way back, actually, to 2010, your episode, Meet the Southern Poverty Law Center. So now do you think, I mean, in lots of different ways, we see once the the build reaches a tipping point that things are kind of unstoppable. And if there's so much blood in the water and if there are this many lawsuits, they could actually go down. I've also heard discussions of all there, of course, possible offshore accounts and things that they'll keep all cranking the hate. 
Yeah, that's the point. They have uh, much, much more money than you would expect for such a uh, humble little organization, just providing legal aid to those in need, right? What? No, this is not at all what the SPLC is about. It is a racket. And for people who don't know about it, not only will I direct them to the Meet the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, episode of my podcast that I did several years ago, but also the uh, the article I did for the International Forecaster last year, Hate is a Racket, SPLC Caught Funneling Millions Overseas. So you're exactly right about that. Yeah, I'm not sure this uh, a few million here or a few million there is necessarily going to sink them, but it may be the reputational cost um, and sort of the cost of doing their business, as it were, which is essentially to libel people. I mean, that is that is what the SPLC does. So if they start getting caught in the legal games around that, that could be a problem. And you know it's a problem when the Washington Post runs an op-ed under the headline, the Southern Poverty Law Center has lost all credibility. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty uh, big step. So yeah, things are unraveling pretty quickly for the SPLC. And uh, the only thing I can say is what took so long, because as I say, this this is their modus operandi. This is what they do. They just label anyone who has a different political opinion them of as them as extremists. And so, of course, yes, that is libel. That is reputational damage. And it's just insanity that they've been doing it for as long as they have. And I've been hearing for years about various people. I mean, Luke Rogowski and We Are Change and all of these types of organizations and groups and people that you know in the alt media have been put in their extremist hate map, you know, whatever. This is the, the hate groups we have to watch out for type of list. And I've heard talk about, oh, we should sue them, we should sue them. But, well, someone finally has gone through with that and has won. And uh, hopefully this is just the start of a very long, slow, painful process for the SPLC. Not in the, not in the literal, physical pain sense, of course, but I mean the financial pain that, uh, that is some sort of restitution for the pain that they've caused all the people that they have falsely labeled as extremists. So uh, the tides are turning, and uh, yes, I would say this is, this is on the good news side of the ledger. Well, and it just actually kind of struck me as as we were talking about it right here. It took someone to finally actually sue them. Churches and religious organizations generally have a good chunk of change. So I would not be surprised if we see actually a lot of these organizations. Again, it'll be kind of that revenge the uh, you know what's the dish served cold. James, what well what if they you know their name will get tarnished, they'll just maybe just move it around and change the name and they'll be absorbed into some other thing, as is quite the style. James, I broadcast news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Hope people come check it out. Well, I'm looking forward to the revivification of the good news next week. I think we can all use a little bit of that. So I'll stay tuned to the Media Monarchy feeds uh, to make sure that I get it when it drops. I hope everyone else will do the same. Until then, James, talk to you next week. All right, buddy. Take care. The real power is in taking matters into your own hand, deciding what you will do each and every day. You vote every single day with how you choose to spend your time, what you spend your money on, who you spend, uh, who you befriend and who you shun. All of that is your vote that you make every day. And those are the votes that matter.